majority of the people attending are not surgeons, um, and this is a talk that will help the non-surgeon understand what the state of the art is in technology and lower extremity revascularization. Bill Pevick is going to talk about uh, using intraoperative and other imaging technologies for optimizing results of bypasses. And it's also for the surgeons. Uh, this is a, a little bit of uh, how he does it and uh, the, the state of the art in uh, Bill Pevick's operating room, which uh, uh, puts the bar pretty high. Thanks, Dave. I have no uh, disclosures, but I do have a couple complaints. Uh, <laughs> every year I ask Dave not to give me the boring old-fashioned surgery topic. And I ask him not to put me on the program after a masterful presenter like John Laird. And the program comes out, and I feel like this guy. <laughs> but anyway, it's, it, the, as anyone who does inframental uh, vein grafts know, it's a very unforgiving uh, procedure. You really have to have a perfect reconstruction. One tiny imperfection can ruin the entire operation. The pitfalls include a, an intrinsic problem with the vein used for the conduit, a problem with uh, the anastomotic technique, problems with either the inflow or the outflow arteries, external compression of the vein, or a kinked or twisted vein from a, a tunnel problem. And as I said, a single focal defect can ruin an otherwise really good operation. So you can spend six or seven hours doing a bypass and have made one one-second mistake and the whole thing doesn't work. So you really have to make these perfect. I think it's even more important in the current uh, day and age. I went back and looked at my uh, own experience, went back arbitrarily 10 years and looked at the number of vein grafts I did virtually all for critical limb ischemia. I don't treat many patients for claudication with uh, arterial disease below the groin. And I compared 2000 to 2010. And my vein practice, vein bypass, uh, bypass practice has almost gone away as I've shifted to an endovascular approach to these patients. You do a few of these procedures, you're not as good at them anymore. So I think it's really important for surgeons who have a combined endovascular and open practice that they really pay attention to the things to optimize perfection with their uh, open bypass case volumes. So the algorithm I recommend, again, this is not based on data, this is just my own bias, is it's really important to do excellent preoperative evaluation, which includes a, a high quality arterial diagnostic study, either use a CT angiogram, uh, MRA or a good uh, uh, catheter-based arteriogram, and then also to do duplex ultrasound evaluation to find the optimal vein conduit. And then the other component I think is very important is the interoperative assessment, because again, these uh, procedures are totally unforgiving of any minor defect. And that includes, uh, I'm a strong proponent of angioscopy of the vein, which is a technique which is not widely applied these days, and then always some sort of completion study, either a duplex scan or an arteriogram. I'm going to go over angioscopy a bit because, again, I don't think too many surgeons use this technique, and I think it really is very valuable. The components include a fiber optic scope, which includes both an illuminating bundle and then a visual bundle, uh, very delicate uh, scopes. We use uh, disposable angioscopes, which are uh, really a, a huge advantage because they don't last. Uh, we, the old uh, reusable ones we used in the distant past just don't hold up. You need a light source, an infusion pump, and then a video camera with a high-resolution monitor. Uh, the advantage of angioscopy is twofold. One is to assess the quality of the vein. You'll frequently have a vein that will look good on duplex scan and look good on external inspection, but then when you want to use the vein, you'll find out it, it fails because either there are some residual valves that are thickened and don't open, or there are webs from previous recanalization of, of, of prior thrombus. This is a, uh, an interoperative photograph. You can see the red arrow is pointing to a, a, a small web. It's a, a recanalized segment. Small web like this, you can actually take your valvulars home, which is a silver instrument you see there, and under angioscopic guidance, you can divide those webs. But if you have the choice, you're better off using a vein segment that has none of those type of defects. And this is another uh, interoperative image showing a uh, chronic thrombus adhering to the wall of the vein. In addition to assessing for underlying defects in the vein, angioscopy is also very uh, helpful if you are going to do valvulotomy. I tend to use most of my veins in a non-reversed direction. I've never been able to get good enough to figure out how to anastomose a small vein to a big artery. So I like to have the sizes match up. So I either use an in-situ technique or a non-reversed transpose technique. And as the imaging is showing here, you uh, introduce the, uh, the angioscope in a, in a retrograde direction, and then you uh, uh, you can use that to guide the lysis of the valves. Uh, this is an interoperative photo of uh, angioscopic image of a vein 
uh, valve open. You use a little gentle uh, uh, flow through the, uh, the, the uh, irrigation system of the angioscope, and it closes the valve, and then you can come up the other direction and engage the valve with an, uh, a valve of the tome, the arrow showing a valve that's been adequately lysed. You don't actually remove the valves. What you need to do is just render them incompetent, and it's entirely important that you lyse that valve all the way to the wall of the vein. If you leave a little residual cuff on the edge of the vein, if you don't get it cut all the way to the wall here, that's enough to cause the whole uh, reconstruction to fail. The other place where the angioscope really helps, it's quite easy to get the uh, valve of the tome caught into a side branch and tug and pull that and, and damage the vein, and the, really it's very unforgiving of those type of injuries. Again, not a whole lot of data to support this. This is a, uh, a, an old study, and what it shows here is a, they, they took patients and they just reviewed their series of ones that used angioscopy on them and the patients they didn't. The assisted primary patency was undifferent, was, was, uh, was, uh, was not different between the two groups, but the group with angioscopy did not require many revisions to keep the, uh, the main graft open. It looked like about 30% of the patients without angioscopy, actually some defect was left behind that could have been fixed in the OR. Granted, the surgeon was able to come back with a secondary procedure and fix that defect, but I think if you can identify these uh, up front, your patients appreciate it and your outcomes are going to be better. I think angioscopy is, is, is vital when you're using an arm vein for a conduit. The arm veins are frequently uh, accessed in our patients. These are old patients who have a lot of comorbidities. They've been in the hospital a lot. They've had a lot of IVs. Uh, and this is a, a report from uh, uh, the New England Deaconess Hospital with a very large uh, pop, uh, diabetic population. Uses a lot of arm, gra arm veins for the grafts, and they found a significant incidence of interluminal defects in those arm veins. You can find those, find those with angioscopy. If they're mild, you can, uh, you can correct them, and if they're major, you'll find another segment of vein to use. Then the, uh, the last interoperative step that I strongly recommend, I'm going to go over this a little bit because I think this is a really important uh, adjunct to, uh, to getting perfect bypasses, is doing the completion interoperative duplex scan. It has the advantage over arteriography of no contrast. You don't have to disrupt your field. You don't have to puncture any artery or, or your graft. Very high resolution uh, with the current duplex scanners. In addition to giving just uh, anatomic information, gives you flow information, which is probably the more important question with vein grafts. And most of us follow our vein grafts post-operatively with duplex scanning. So this is you're using the like modality interoperatively to give that first assessment. You see a problem on your subsequent follow or difference on your subsequent follow-up study. Uh, you know that something's changed. It's not something you just left behind. There are some disadvantages, though. You're basically limited to your uh, sterile field. You can't duplex through the drapes, and so you're limited to what you have exposed. And obviously, it requires the, uh, to have an available duplex scanner. Really requires to have somebody else to help you because you can certainly do the scan, but uh, you can't uh, adjust the images or, or do any of the work on the keyboard. So you really need an assistant. Uh, and it's really nice if you can get a uh, technologist to come down and do the scan for you also. Lots of different things that you can pick up on a duplex evaluation of the reconstruction. You can find uh, residual stenosis or fibrosis in the vein if you didn't do angioscopy. You can find incomplete valve lysis, particularly if you did it in a, a, a typical blind technique. You can find fiber and platelet aggre aggregates which can form in the vein during the procedure and can lead to early thrombosis. You can clearly find problems with the, the nastomosis. You can find clamp injury, particularly at the inflow or the outflow arteries. You can find problems with the inflow or outflow arteries that may have been previously undetected. And you can look at a low flow, uh, detect low flow velocity throughout the graph, which can suggest that you either have an uh, inadequate conduit or more likely inadequate uh, arteries above or below your reconstruction. This is just a uh, uh, picture of the uh, typical uh, scene in the OR, covering up the probe, getting ready to go. As, as opposed to carotid duplex scan, carotid duplex scan interoperatively is really more dependent on the B mode, I think. You can see the defects in the carotid artery that you need to correct. For the lower extremity, it's really much more dependent on the spectral analysis of the blood flow. And you really want to do a complete study. You want to see as much, uh, you at least want to see a segment of the inflow artery. You want to look at the entire graft, including uh, the anastomoses, and you want to look at the outflow artery. Uh, the, the things that you can find with reversed or translocated vein where you've taken it and, and put it through a tunnel, there's a risk of a compression or a kink that you might not otherwise detect that you'll see with the elevation and velocity. And it's really helpful for inside two graphs to identify uh, side branches or for inside two graphs or non-reverse graphs to find residual valves have not been completely lysed. 
And this is just a, a B mode image showing an incompletely lysed valve. You can still see an intact valve leaflet, pretty obviously there. The, uh, the flow patterns you'll see interoperatively are different than what you're going to see uh, in a typical post-op study. What you want to see on your interoperative study is a low resistance signal with a significant flow throughout diastole. So in a, in, you know, a bypass graft, you're going to look at months later, you may not want to see a monophasic waveform like that because that may suggest that there's an inflow problem. But interoperatively, if you don't see high flow throughout diastole, that suggests the patient has inadequate outflow bed, that graft's probably going to fail. So the, this is the pattern you want to see, ideally, in a, a well-functioning bypass graft. A low flow graft is a predictor of early failure with a diffuse peak systolic velocity below 40 centimeters per second throughout the graft, because that can imply either inadequate inflow or inadequate outflow. There's just not enough volume flow through the graft. However, that's with a caveat that you'll see low, diffusely low velocities throughout a graft if the graft diameter is significantly larger than the outflow artery. So if you've got a, you're lucky enough to have a patient with a four or five millimeter vein that you sewed into a two millimeter tibial artery, there are going to be low velocity flows throughout that graft, that's okay. But if you have a pretty even size match between the vein and the outflow artery and you have diffusely low flow, uh, flow velocities throughout the graft, there's a problem someplace, either at the inflow or the outflow artery. There have been published criteria of uh, how to define a stenosis. The most common thing you're going to detect on the duplex scan is a stenosis either in the graft itself from a problem with a, a web or a valve or a problem at the anastomosis. And the bottom line is a peak systolic velocity greater than 180 centimeters per second or a velocity ratio from proximal to the defect to distal to it where the velocity increases by a factor of 2.5 to 4 are the ones that you need to intervene on right at that time. It takes, uh, obviously, some uh, experience and judgment to really pick out which defects you need to intervene on, but clearly patients who have significant increases in the velocity ratio in a focal area uh, probably need to be revised if you want to have a, a successful bypass. You can also, with the completion duplex scan, if you use an in situ technique, uh, identify residual arterial venous fistulae, residual vein branches that you have not ligated. You can sometimes see the branch itself with color flow Doppler. If there's an AV fistula, you'll see unusually low resistance proximal to the fistula and then higher resistance distal to it. Uh, not all of them need to be corrected, but uh, some of these can compromise graft flow. This is just an example of the, the sample volumes here looking right at the AV fistula. You can see turbulent flow on the color mapping, and you can see this very turbulent uh, flow, uh, high resistance turbulent flow, lot of spectral broadening, high diastolic flow, and this is proximal uh, proximal to the AV fistula where this uh, sample volume was taken. And this is, a, this is actually, this is actually, that was right at the fistula, this is the same graft. And this is uh, proximal to the graft where there's a lot of end diastolic flow and a lot of turbulence. And uh, excuse me, proximal to the fistula. And then distal to the fistula, that, uh, that turbulence has gone away, the spectral broadening's gone away, there's a nice window. And you still have good end diastolic flow, flow but not quite at the same velocity as you had more proximally. The hardest thing on the interoperative duplex scan is to figure out when there's a high velocity at the distal anastomosis, is that an anastomotic problem or is that just spasm in the artery? If you're sewing particularly the tibial arteries, they tend to spasm just from the surgical manipulation. You get high velocities and you'll, at first if you, if you just react to velocity, you'll end up operating on, or at least get an arteriogram on every distal anastomosis because they all have high velocities. So certainly if you see a defect on the B-mode image, uh, that, that sees some narrowing, you see a flap, that's one thing um, that suggests a stenosis. But just a, a velocity, and if there's a focal elevation of the velocity with the defect on the image, that suggests there's a problem. And this is an example of a patient with a stenosis at the distal anastomosis. You can see, it looks like there's a defect here. The graft, the hood of the graft is pulled in a little bit. There's a lot of turbulence here, and there's a high systolic velocity of uh, over 250 centimeters per second. Spasm. As, a, as opposed to a focal defect, you'll see a, uh, a more diffuse elevation of the velocity, and that velocity will stay elevated uh, into the outflow artery. And this is an example on the color flow B-mode imaging. The, and this is a distal anastomosis to a tibial artery. Again, it looks nice here. Uh, you don't see anything that looks bad. And the velocities are elevated not only at the distal anastomosis, but in the, the dorsal peel artery, or in the distal outflow artery, as this dorsal peel artery, and a couple centimeters farther out in the artery, the velocities remain elevated. So that's probably more spasm than, uh, than a defect. 
And finally, I personally don't use completion arteriography uh, for a typical bypass, although it's certainly a reasonable choice. I clearly would use it, though, uh, any time you're doing a hybrid procedure or you're doing a, uh, you're going to use imaging anyway. So a patient who's having a thrombectomy or embolectomy for acute ischemia, or if you're doing a hybrid procedure where you're doing partial endovascular uh, recanalization and a bypass, the patient's already on the angio table, you might as well go ahead and get the completion arteriogram. And this is just an example of a patient. This uh, patient actually turns out had a, uh, he had a synthetic bypass graft, uh, but we then did angioplasty of the anterior tibial and perineal arteries, as well as the completion arteriogram at the end of the procedure. So in summary, uh, the algorithm is to get high quality diagnostic arterial study, imaging study to, to select the right uh, uh, inflow and outflow sites, good preoperative uh, ultrasound to get the best vein, use angioscopy to uh, optimize the conduit, use a completion duplex scan or an arteriogram at the end of the procedure. Uh, with this algorithm, I've been able to virtually eliminate take back for early problems. Graphs still fail late, but they don't, you don't take them back that night. Uh, and it, I think it also minimizes early graft revisions within the first few months. And I would say that if you don't use imaging techniques for your bypass, you're basically operating blind. Thank you.